The four basic elements that an artist is going to be looking for when they're composing a still life is that first they're going to choose their objects, and uh, then they're going to place them in space, because the space is just as important as the object, and then they're going to consider their lighting, and then last of all they think about the framing, how the total composition actually works within the height and width of the finished image. It's a painting of uh, everything within arm's reach. It's everything that's touchable. It's everything that you could lift with your hand. It's about a manual and gestural space. One peculiarity of still life painting is that, by and large, the world stops at the far edge of the table. It just, it ends. You don't even ask why. It's so cleverly done, you don't think, hey, they're censoring this. What have they got beyond the table? It's far more interesting in the tactile world and the interplay between things that you dare I touch this glass, things that you lift and are used to and get so used to that you don't see them anymore. So one of the things that European still life gets into is supposing this is about the objects that are so familiar and everyone's got them, so much so that you would never look at them. It's a sort of re-enchantment of the things that are overlooked that are so taken for granted that you don't see them anymore. Well, literally, a still life painting is a painting of inanimate objects, but it clearly is not adequate because any still life painting from the middle of the 17th century is likely to have beetles and bugs and snails and live animals, so the term itself is only approximate. During the Italian Renaissance, the ancient city of Milan was one of the world's key centers of art and learning. Among the many treasures still to be found here, is one deceptively simple painting that is of vital importance in the story of still life. We are in the Pinacoteca Ambrosiana. Its origins go back to the donation made by Cardinal Federico Borromeo in 1618 when he decided to donate his private collection to the Ambrosiana, thus found in the oldest museum in Milan. Although the collection is not a huge collection site, nevertheless, we have amazing masterpieces. The Pinacoteca has many very important masterpieces, but definitely there is one which deserves special attention. Here is the famous basket of fruit by Caravaggio, which is surely one of the most important pieces of our collection. one of the most fascinating, beautiful, enigmatic, important works of art, not only in the history of still life painting, but in the whole of European art. I mean, it looks for all the world like a commonplace basket of fruit, and yet it's painted with a realism, with an intensity, and with a sense of detail, an immediacy that certainly is unparalleled. And historically, of course, in this painting, Caravaggio has painted the very first known still life painting of a basket of fruit. When this work was first created, the people at that time had never seen anything like it. The Basket of Fruit is recognized as the first major work of Western still life. It was painted in 1596 by the infamous artist Michelangelo Messi di Caravaggio. And by doing something as seemingly obvious as depicting this simple basket of fruit, Caravaggio had written a new chapter in art history. Caravaggio was a rather dark character, very ambitious. And when he's 21, he paints his only still life painting. But it's a basket of fruit that wants to be something else. It wants to be a, a painting about life and death and resurrection and salvation and whether you can achieve such a thing. 
And you can imagine there's a man full of doubts, and I think that doubt is in that painting. The forms that he makes uh, are all extremely imperfect. There isn't anything that hasn't been ravaged by a worm or a bug or some kind of foliage disease because Caravaggio loves things when they're imperfect and they're damaged. The symbolism in the painting is quite highly charged. The apples are conspicuously worm-eaten. They're meant to bring to mind the apple from which Eve ate, which condemned man to sin, death and time. And their counterpoint is the vine leaves, which stand for Christ. They stand for the wine that is Christ's blood that saves us from death. So the painting is about death, the worm eaten apple, and the hope for eternal life, the vine. And yet Caravaggio always leaves space for doubt. Some of the vine leaves have begun to wither, and they seem almost to have turned into hands, gesturing, reaching for salvation, as if salvation isn't in fact certain. And the whole basket of fruit teeters on the edge of the ledge as if about to fall. It's a picture that's got so much in embryo of what makes him an extraordinary artist. It's one of the great paintings in the world. Caravaggio's still life resurrected one of the most popular and fascinating of art's disciplines. The impact of the work can only really be understood in the context of what it can be for. With his humble subject, dedication to realism, and sublime technique. Caravaggio had revived a genre of painting lost since antiquity. In ancient Egypt, large-scale tomb paintings have been discovered that contain elements familiar to still life. Again, ancient Greek art also depicted simple objects that point towards the genre. But the finest examples of the ancient world's still life wouldn't be revealed until a discovery in the mid-18th century. From under the ash of Pompeii, early excavations of the site uncovered 2,000-year-old Roman still life frescoes. There are interesting examples in Roman art of paintings of fruit and fish and water and jugs of wine. And these are described as works of Xenia art. Now Xenia is a fantastic ancient Greek word. It means a kind of guest-host friendship, or the gifts that are given between guests and hosts. The Xenia paintings aren't just pretty things. They're not there just to show off the skill of the artist. They have a job of work to do. Um, the Roman Empire is a massive place. People are travelling the whole time. There's a huge trade in goods, in ideas. Uh, there's a lot of political visits from diplomats. And I think in some ways the Xenia paintings are kind of saying to the wider world, we're a cosmopolitan society. We accept people who travel from foreign lands. And this is the kind of hospitality that you can expect from us. These Xenia paintings are the clearest examples of ancient still life that form a direct link with the later tradition of European work. Whoever painted this fresco was thinking in exactly the same way as artists who would come later. The subjects chosen are domestic. These are humble things. There's a range of textures on display. We can see a dialogue between the natural and the man-made. Objects overhang the edge of the table, breaking the line, emphasizing perspective. Even in the earliest work in the genre, we can see defined rules of composition. And there's another link between ancient Xenia and still life we know today, the direction of light. do is just move my hand very very loosely and expressively over the surface of the paper which is just making a first response to the, the shape and the texture and the size and the weight of the subject. Fairly soon I'm going to be thinking about the lighting of it because I want this to look three-dimensional and I'm instinctively lighting from the left. If you go to a national gallery and you have a look at a broad spectrum of still life, have a look at which direction the light is coming from. And in the majority of paintings, it's going to be coming from the left-hand side. So here we have a classic example, Caravaggio's basket of fruit. And the light is very clearly coming from the left. We can see the shadow just underneath the grapes and also on this side of the basket. From the left. 
from the left, from the left, from the left, from the left. Perhaps it's to do with literacy. The fact that in the West we are learning to read and write from infancy. We are dealing with text and the input of written information from left to right, left to right, left to right. So it's almost as if the Western brain has been programmed to take in information and therefore to prefer the receipt of information from left to right. It's in the Xenia frescoes discovered at Pompeii we find all the emerging rules of still life. The genre was pioneered within Roman visual culture, but no matter how skilled the work or popular its appeal, still life was destined to be considered the lowest form of art. A fact one of Rome's greatest authors and philosophers would be quick to point out. Pliny the Elder was a Roman period author. He worked and lived in the first century AD. Very, very prolific. And his great work is The Natural History. It's an extraordinary undertaking. In a way, it's the world's first encyclopedia. And why this is so significant for us is that there's a whole paragraph devoted to a discussion of still life and whether still life is a higher or a lower form of painting. In a way, this is Pliny as the world's first art critic because he's introducing a particular painter called Paracus, who is supposed to be a splendid artist and to have extraordinary talent. And yet, as Pliny says, the question is whether he'd based himself because he chose to paint simple and base things. And he's actually got a fantastic Latin word to describe him. He calls him a rai parographus, which means a painter of low and meanly things. Um, he was successful, he, as Pliny says here, he attained great glory, his work sold for a lot of money, and yet this is really marginalising still life painting. This is saying this is not a higher form of the art, this is something which really is base. Pliny's words would set the tone on how still life would now be rated. It would be seen as vulgar, less worthy than other supposedly superior genres to be practiced by those artists of lower status. But it wasn't just marginalization that would be the issue. When the Roman Empire fell, the art of still life would fall with it. It would vanish. Europe would now enter the medieval age, and there would be no place for painting ordinary objects. The period commonly referred to as medieval, it's over a thousand years long. It starts around the fall of Rome, so about 400 AD, and it continues right up until the Renaissance, you could say up until 1500 AD. But what's De the defining characteristic of this period is the rise of Christianity, the all-pervasive impact of Christianity, particularly on visual culture. Christian painting had no place really for ordinary secular objects because it was always the higher world, it was a, a heavenly world, a very radiant world. If you get an artist who simply painting bowls of oranges or bunches of flowers, that's not really helping anyone. It's not contributing to Christian society. Still life doesn't actually exist in the medieval period as a specific artistic genre. You don't get objects in isolation. They tend to function as symbols or attributes. So for example, the apple. If you saw a painting, an image of an apple, the medieval mind would immediately start connecting that with other narratives, other connections. For example, Adam and Eve. So the apple would be a symbol of the fall from grace that Adam and Eve um, undertake after having eaten the apple from the tree of knowledge. And if it was depicted in visual culture, you wouldn't see just an apple by itself. You would have the apple, and then you would have Adam and Eve, the tree and the serpents as well. The Catholic Church was the absolute force behind medieval art. In biblical terms, anything that glorified a mere object was strictly forbidden. There were to be no graven images. But one particular painting does take us a step closer to the rehabilitation of still life. This is Duccio's The Annunciation, painted over 700 years ago. It contains Renaissance still life in embryo, when the simplest things began to acquire a symbolic power, all of their own. 
the angel Gabriel was sent to a virgin, and the virgin's name was Mary. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. I suppose one way of um, thinking about Christian art is that it was a kind of visual Bible um, for an, a largely illiterate population. When the high art of the Middle Ages developed, it was not only something that was beautiful for its own sake, but it would have, have an instrumental educational value. So, so you would see the angel and Mary devoutly, eyes bowed and listening to this solemn address and consenting uh, to do the will of God. But there would be little interpretative tools in there, and probably the classic one um, is the vase of lilies, lilies being um, a sign of sexual innocence. This is very loaded, very potent symbolism. The object is still relegated in terms of its scale and prominence within religious painting, but the item is growing in symbolic power, and it was this, alongside a technical development in paint, that would provide a launch pad for the re-emergence of still life. Up until now, all major artworks used tempera. This was a paint which used opaque egg yolk to bind pigments, and it restricted what great artists could achieve. It required small brush strokes, dried quickly, and had a dull matte finish. It would take a new innovation to allow still life to grow towards illusion. That's where oil comes in, as a new, a relatively new binding medium. It does create a revolution, if you like, in terms of what the artist can show. Housed at St. Barbara Cathedral in Belgium is the first major painting of the Renaissance to take full advantage of the new medium, the Ghent altarpiece from 1432. Oil allowed artists to achieve greater virtuosity. Compared to a generation before, they could now paint with a new level of intense detail. A mix of natural and man-made materials that would soon become the mainstays of still life are all on display. But now, it's as if you could almost hold the objects in your hand. oil you can create much more depth and light and shadows and contrast between light and dark uh, all things that are crucial to render all these materials properly I think the development of oil painting is hugely important for still life the early painters of oil they took those small scale skills of being able to depict flowers and fruit oil paint enabled them to take that onto the large scale and they could create these wonderful effects. Oil paint just gives this whole new life and light and sense of moisture and freshness to art. By the 16th century, the church continued to be the main commissioner of European art. But now painters were depicting elements of still life with a new sense of obsessive detail. Artists' love affair with the ordinary stuff of life would grow and grow, until still life would begin masquerading as religious work. And there are no better examples of this bold artistic duplicity than at the National Gallery in London. In The Four Elements, by Flemish painter Joachim Bucher, the artist has to satisfy the demands of the church. So we find Jesus appearing to his disciples after the resurrection. But true prominence in the painting is given to a market scene, teeming with details of fish. The Son of God has been firmly pushed into the background. Now we see Christ seated with Mary and Martha after raising Lazarus from the dead. But Buchala has positioned Jesus away in the back room. He's little bigger than a loaf of bread placed in a foreground littered with elements of still life. 
In a painting of the same Bible story by Spanish artist Velasquez, we see the same ploy of inserting still life within religious works. Again, the figure of Jesus. But the fish, which are the symbol of Christianity, are given more prominence than Christ himself. After a thousand years of being hidden from view, still life has begun to climb out from behind the veil of religion. So Christianity's got a very odd relationship to still life, because from one point of view, and indeed for centuries, it wouldn't tolerate it. There'd be no place in a world that wanted radiant golden heaven around the saints and figures of the Bible. There's going to be no place for the everyday. But when still life does revive, it's revived through Christianity. It's, it rides on the coattails of Christianity. By 1596, when Caravaggio finally painted the basket of fruit, he achieved something that no one had seen in living memory. He eliminated every obvious feature of grand religious narrative and placed the sole focus on a humble, simple object. He'd created a world without God. Although he brought the genre out from the shadows, Caravaggio would never paint another still life in his career. Although his fruit basket is such a famous picture, that's Caravaggio on the way up. That's what he wants to leave behind, that kind of work. He wants to paint human bodies in action. By the early 1600s, Caravaggio was being commissioned to paint important religious pictures, such as this painting of Christ and the disciples at Emmaus. In other words, he had become a major provider of pictures to the Catholic authorities, applying the realism of his early years to the business of depicting scenes from the Bible. Caravaggio may have begun to focus on explicitly religious subjects, but he still finds space for an old friend. The basket of fruit has been here at the Ambrosiana since the gallery opened in 1607. It was added to the collection by the founder, Cardinal Federico Borromeo. Borromeo was a major collector of art during the Renaissance and a key figure in the development of still life painting. His love for the basket of fruit made him desire more works in a similar vein. He began to commission other early still life works from further afield. If you go to Milan and you look at the Ambrosiana collection, on the one hand you've got Caravaggio, on the other hand you've got Raphael, but then you've got huge amounts of Dutch still life painting. This spectacular flower piece at the Ambrosiana is by the Flemish painter Jan Bruegel. As part of their studies, Northern European artists like Bruegel would make the pilgrimage south to soak up the influence of the masters of Italian art. It was very important for artists to go there. It was part of their training, their education. And you do see influences on their work when they come back. It has a huge impact on their style and uh, development. I think it's hardly surprising that Northerners were drawn in particular to Caravaggio and took these lessons back with them to the North and became integral, became rooted, embedded in the art of the North in the 1600s. It was in Northern Europe that still life would fulfill its potential, and in particular, tiny Holland, that would provide the setting for a golden age. I think it's incomparable um, what happened in Amsterdam especially in Amsterdam around 1600, um, to see well, how this, this art market almost exploded all of a sudden. amazing how fast still life spreads in Europe. It really is a, a mass phenomenon. By 
by the 17th century, Dutch painters returning from Italy were coming home to a nation that had been revolutionized by a political and religious storm, the Protestant Reformation. An iconoclastic rage swept the country, transforming visual culture. The extravagant Catholic art that had dominated for over a thousand years was torn down, destroyed. The Dutch had declared themselves a republic, free from the influence of monarchy, free from the Catholic Church. A new Protestant merchant class wanted a different type of art. Art that reflected a new world they'd created for themselves. This is really secular painting. It's almost the first era of absolutely non-religious painting in the world. And of course, the thing that's making that power of secularism is the economy, what's happening with the economy. The Dutch refer to the 17th century as their golden age, and with good reason. This small republic on the northern edge of Europe, uncoupled from the church and monarchy, used its freedom to transform itself into an economic and cultural superpower. They were, quite simply, the richest nation on earth. This is the 17th century canal house of the Van Loon family, the most influential of Amsterdam's merchants who weren't slow in enjoying their new affluence. Their fabulous wealth, like that of the nation, was built on vast maritime trading networks that spread across the globe. The Dutch ships were trading all over the world and they were bringing in masses of, of stuff all sorts of materials and objects into the Netherlands and into the rest of uh, Europe, which you also find in the still life paintings from the period. So you find Chinese porcelain, exotic flowers, exotic fruit, all that sort of thing. In still life painting, the Dutch work out their relationship to things. They're in a way the first consumer society. So they are awash in plenty and in luxury goods. The Dutch art market boomed like no other market in Europe had boomed. But it went with the idea that when you get wealth, you should decorate your house, your home. So it's, the only other, it's the only foyer for the display of wealth in the Netherlands, because there isn't a court and there isn't a church that's going to gobble up the national surplus wealth. So it's in the home. So the, the primary object of Dutch wealth is the paintings. Dutch culture was unique in that Everybody was buying paintings, you know. The postman was buying paintings, the baker was buying paintings. The baker owned several vermeers. This was art for everybody. In these early decades of the 17th century, millions of paintings must have been made, so it was a fully new market. A mass market for paintings on this scale had never been seen anywhere in the world before. Art became an industry. And such was the craze for still life, the customer savvy painters began to develop mass production techniques to satisfy the demand. Okay, this is a still life with that game from Franz Snyder's. Hans Snijders uh, went to Italy uh, for a short period and uh, after he came back he developed much more his own style. So it was clearly a very in important discipline. So it's, it's a very interesting piece in terms of uh, studio practice because um, when you look at this particular painting you can see there's big motifs of the, the, the roe deer, the boar, uh, the lobster on the plates, uh, the dead birds here and there fruit, vegetables, everything is in there. And um, if you look at other works by Snyders, you find that these motifs have been used again and again. We know by making the tracing of the deer on transparent foil, Malinex foil, and then placed it on other paintings by Franz Snyder, showing the same motif. And with small variations, very small variations, it fitted quite well. 
So the idea that a painter would sit with this whole banquet here in front of him is not really realistic. Uh, in this case, Snyders would have drawings of all these different motifs and he would combine them in a, in, into an interesting composition and repeat that with different combinations for other paintings. There was an incredibly demanding market, so they needed to produce quite large numbers of works. And this is an efficient way of creating new compositions. Creating fictional compositions became commonplace. Perhaps the perfect example of Dutch artists foregoing reality in pursuit of striking composition can be seen in their approach to nature with floral still life. Looking at the flower paintings of the 17th century, it's about bringing together as many beautiful, rare, and exotic examples of flowers as you possibly could. It's done purely for pictorial effect. It's very much this anti-natural impulse. And so what you're looking at is what humans do with nature, not nature itself. You find flower painting where species that could not possibly exist in the same seasonal moment are brought together in a kind of triumph of wealth and ownership. I think what they are is a kind of coded celebration of the Dutch Republic's power and influence. Because what you get is you get these flowers from different parts of the world in which the Dutch have been trading and yet they're all in the same vase. So the, what the vase of flowers expresses is the extent, the global extent, of Dutch maritime trade. That painting is a kind of whoosh, this is us. It's a bouquet of power. During the Golden Age, fortunes could even be made in the flowers themselves. And in particular, this new import from Asia. Tulip mania, as it was called, saw the trade in tulip bulbs become engulfed in crazed financial speculation sending prices soaring. The bulb of a single tulip could cost three times as much as a house. So they were such rare and exotic plants that no one would cut them. You wouldn't have tulips as cut flowers in, in real life because they were just too expensive and, you know, you just would never do it. In paintings, to see a whole bouquet of just tulips was outrageous. Displays of outrageous affluence took several forms and were commonplace in Golden Age still life. The Dutch were hungry for the prestige that went with consumption. Another genre that's developed are banquet pieces where you get tables not unlike this amazing table here that are absolutely uninhibited displays of maximum possession of wealth. Lobster and crayfish are not normal foodstuffs in the Netherlands. Um, citrus fruit doesn't grow in the Netherlands, it all has to be brought in. So it's a celebration of that kind of power to bring together in one place all the luxury of the world. As the genre matures, you find that the scene of consumption, the scene of wealth, becomes increasingly barbarous. Things are pushed over, um, and the whole table is sort of strewn with a kind of principle of litter. It, it's wreckage, it's like destruction, consumption as a destruction. At the same time, it's a Calvinist culture, a tremendous amount of guilt about acquisition. They're generally worried that although they've worked hard for this, so they've earned it, nonetheless, in wealth itself is a principle of corruption that will undo them or undo their souls or make them unhappy. So you find a very odd kind of push-pull thing happening in Dutch still life painting, between on the one hand, a perfectly understandable desire to celebrate all this wealth with which the country is awash, at the same time, a sort of residual religious sentiment, this is not good. Strictly speaking, as devout Calvinists, the Dutch shouldn't be celebrating their affluence with decorative art. So how do you keep collecting paintings and avoid the corrupting influence of acquisition? Still life painters had an answer for these guilty Protestants, containing a message with a rather daunting reminder of mortality. The subject of the Vanitas, the painting that reminds us of death, is a whole class of still life painting where the symbols of death and immortality and the transience of human life are so obvious that they can't be avoided. 
Most often we recognize a Van Klaas painting by the presence of a skull, which is sort of a dead giveaway that, you know, everything else around um, the skull has to do with the idea of death and transience and the futility of accumulating material possessions because when you die, you don't take it with you. Very often another component that we see are helmets or militaria that remind you of the futility of war, ultimately. A lot of times you see items that have to do with music, because before recorded music, music was something that existed only as you played it, and as soon as you stopped, it was dead. It didn't exist anymore. It's as if these people are celebrating their riches, and yet there's always this vanitas undertow of meaning, you know, all of this is going to fade, it will pass. And Holland, you know, Holland was a hugely volatile nation. Fortunes were made and lost like that, so any depiction of riches, wealth, grandeur and splendour was always, you know, was always threatened. And the still life painting makes that perfectly explicit, you know, you can always imagine pulling that cloth and everything would go onto the floor. Well, life was like that for the Dutch. Despite the millions of paintings that were created in Holland during the 17th century, the most comprehensive collection of Golden Age still life is to be found somewhere a bit closer to home. Berlin has, surprisingly, one of the largest, if not the largest, collection of still life painting from 17th century Holland and Flanders in existence. It's a remarkable collection because it covers every aspect of still life painting in the period from the early 1600s through to the early 1700s. Well, here we are in the collection of still life paintings at last. This collection was given to us in 1939 by a collector from Newcastle called Theodore Ward, who made his money in international paint. The collection was given to us in memory of his widow, Daisy Linda Travers, or Daisy Linda Ward as she became after her marriage, who was an opera singer in her early years. The collection is probably the most comprehensive of its kind in existence. Most of the great names of the 17th century are here in this gallery. And it goes round the room in a sequence passing through the large paintings of Isaac Sorrow, an artist who came from Frankfurt and who painted in a tradition that's slightly different from the tradition that we associate with painting in Holland at this time. The painting by Clara Peters is probably one of the most important paintings in the collection of the Ashmolean. Not because Clara Peters is a famous artist, in fact the opposite is true. Her life is particularly obscure. We don't know where she was born, we don't know when she was born. We're not even sure who taught her to paint. But the pictures themselves bear witness to the accomplishment in the art of still life painting by an artist who was working in the 1620s, 1630s. Her work is magnificent. And as we come round to this long wall, we pass a great display of the more florid painters of the middle years of the 17th century. And it moves through a really sensational group of paintings by Abraham van Byron, whose banquet pieces speak for themselves, so gloriously detailed are they. A grand banquet of a type which no doubt Abraham van Byron himself rarely enjoyed. And we move round the corner into a series of paintings which take us towards the end of the 17th century and into the beginning of the 18th century, when this much more decorative tendency, the more florid and colourful tendency that we saw in these earlier paintings, reaches a kind of rococo apogee. And this is a tendency that continues through into the works of Rachel Rush, for example, whose ornamental and almost rococo pictures represent a final theme in the development of Dutch still life painting as it emerged in the early 1700s. She was a very important artist, but she was also one of the last in this great century of paintings that mark the golden age in the history of the art of still life. I suppose my favourite painting in this gallery is the least typical of them all and one that stands aside from the more sumptuous paintings that have been done in the lifetime of the artist Adrian Court, about whom we know very little. 
You get what you see in a painting like this. It is very um, understated. And the reason why he painted it is particularly opaque, other than the fact that he wanted to make an image, and a particularly liquid and beautifully lit image of such a commonplace thing as a bundle of asparagus. It's making out of the stuff of nature and the commonplace something that is as lasting as a, as a work of art and a thing of beauty. I've never felt so warmly about asparagus in real life as I do in the flat and silent art of still life painting. I love this one. Taking commonplace things and elevating them into objects of great beauty wasn't just restricted to the Netherlands. Spanish painters had also begun to explore the art of materialism. In Spain, which is an immensely powerful country with a huge empire and a vast economy and a very powerful aristocracy, nonetheless, its interpretation of still-life painting is to locate its true being in monasteries, in monastic painting, painted by painters who either were lay brothers or had experience of monastic communities. These austere arrangements were painted by a Spanish Carthusian monk, Juan Sanchez Coutan. They're known as works of bodegans, larder pieces. The items of food featured were stored within a concrete block and suspended on string to help with refrigeration. Unlike his contemporaries in the Netherlands, Cotin was a dedicated realist, painting the world exactly as he found it. If you look at um, Cotin, he's very much about a kind of renunciation of the world. It's about leading the world, not believing in the world's show. Looking at the simplest things in the world because your values are adjusted to the values of monastic life, contemplative life. So it, in some Spanish still life painting, you get simply the contents of the larder. It, is, it could not be more unimportant. They're arranged in these these um, suspensions of string that make them seem like mathematical constructions or like the solar system. They look, they look completely out of this world. They look otherworldly. Otherworldly is still life. No other school does that. the 17th century had seen the golden age of still life, in the 18th it suffered a more complicated fate. This is the world famous Louvre in Paris. In its earlier existence it was the French royal palace. By the 18th century Louis XIV, the Sun King, decided that this place wasn't grand enough to suit his rather extravagant tastes and moved his entire court to a new home, Versailles. Back at the Louvre, the building was soon occupied by a new institution that would make Paris the centre of European art. I mean, the French Academy was founded in 1648, and the elected academicians agreed, in effect, what were the rules of art. They, uh, they decided what constituted the best kind of art, what was less important art, what was the least important art. And they also controlled, in effect, royal commissions. So anyone who wanted to get big money for painting needed to go through the Academy. The academies placed a very high value upon drawing and painting the human figure. The life class was the centre of the academy. Artists were chiefly judged by their talent as figure painters. They were trained to paint human figures, they were trained to paint physiognomy, they were trained to paint gesture, action, uh, human drama in other words, which was regarded as the most important element. So that an artist who did not paint the human figure, or indeed in some cases artists who could not paint the human figure, were regarded as the bottom of the heap. The academic tradition of painting placed still life, which just shows inanimate things, absolutely bottom. Then came landscape, which was depiction of the world. Then came portrait, depiction of man. But then the serious stuff begins. Mythological painting, narrative painting, biblical painting. That is high art, because it shows man in action, man in thought. That's, that's why this hierarchy exists. And still life painters are always fighting an uphill battle, always fighting to be taken seriously. Chardin, the great French still life, he's probably the first still life painter to begin to be really taken seriously. He, he fights the good fight. Hmm. 
host once wrote an essay in which he set out to restore a smile to the face of a gloomy, envious and dissatisfied young man. He pictured this young man sitting at a table after lunch one day in his parents' flat, gazing dejectedly at his surroundings. The mundanity of the scene would contrast with the young man's taste for beautiful and costly things, which he lacked the money to buy. Proust imagined the revulsion the young Eastbeat would feel at this bourgeois interior, and how he would compare it to the splendors he had seen in museums and cathedrals. To escape his domestic gloom, the young man might leave the flat and go to the Louvre, where at least he could feast his eyes on splendid things. Touched by his predicament, Proust proposed to make a radical change to the young man's life by way of a modest alteration to his museum itinerary. Rather than let him hurry to galleries hung with paintings by Claude and Veronese, Proust suggested leading him to a quite different part of the museum, to those galleries hung with the works of Jean-Baptiste Chardin. A peach by him was as pink and chubby as a cherub. A plate of oysters or a slice of lemon were tempting symbols of gluttony and sensuality. A skate, slit open and hanging from a hook, evoked the sea of which it had been a fearsome denizen in its lifetime. Its insides, coloured with a deep red blood, blue nerves and white muscles, were like the naves of a polychrome cathedral. After an encounter with Chardin, Proust had high hopes for the spiritual transformation of his sad young man. As he wrote, once he had been dazzled by this opulent description of what he called mediocrity, this appetizing depiction of a life he had found insipid, this great art of nature that he had found so paltry, I should say to him, now, are you happy? I think what's remarkable about Chardin is that he's undeniably a great artist. He's got total command of his medium and none of his uh, critics and uh, observers of his time could possibly deny that this was a master of handling the medium of paint. But what was fascinating and what was such a challenge to his contemporaries was what he decided it was important to paint. He didn't just say that still life was important, he showed in a kind of visceral, sensory way that it could be. Jean-Baptiste Chardin was an 18th century French artist and one of the finest painters of still life the world has ever known. Born in Paris, he never once left the city. He lived in a period dominated by the extravagant Rococo style of neoclassicism. His simple act of revolution was to create a world of truth and calm. In 1728, without establishment contacts and with no intellectual background, Chardin submitted two works to the all-powerful French Academy. He was instantly accepted. He's like a revolutionary force that's constantly being pushed down, this Chardin. Within the Academy, uh, he was given the lowest possible job, which is the person who hangs the paintings for the annual shows. So he's officially, where well, he should be, but at the bottom of the heap. So one has to remember that for the 18th century, in France and in all Europe, in history, the major quality of a painter was invention. Uh, invention. To paint a still life was considered as the most simple thing you could do because you have no invention. You had in front of you at some beaches or so on, and you, you, had, you had to copy them. So it looked as it was so simple to do so. And Chardin, in a certain way, breaks this. He is trying to say, he is proving that in a certain way it is as difficult and as great to paint something you see as something you don't see. And for the 18th century it was very difficult to accept this. He had his own way of thinking, his own way of painting, and in fact, for him, simplicity was one of the keys of the greatness of his art. Simplicity, but what I think is even more important for him, is how to paint, how to paint silence. To paint a fruit is very easy, but to paint silence is very difficult. Chardin is really a sort of peaceful place, it's a sort of peaceful garden, uh, out of time, where you forget uh, the, the trouble of your everyday life. We, we are living around objects, we, uh, we have objects around us everywhere. We are not looking at them, we are forgetting uh, uh, that they are unique in a certain way, that the uh, fruit is unique, that. Uh, a goblet d'argent, you see a silver, silver uh, is, has all his beauties. And an, an artist is a little bit there, especially an artist interested in still life, to make you aware of the beauty of things around you. With such magnificent ability, Chardin's reputation and fame grew. 
And despite his radical choice of lowly subject, he became one of the richest painters in France. In one slightly bizarre work, we can see him parody his own position, whilst poking fun at his detractors within the academy. Chardin, he knows a lot about optics, and is friends with people. We've had conversations about how the eye works. And he introduces something very amazing into still life painting, which is the idea that the eye, that the eye doesn't see everything to the same degree of vigilant high focus. If you look at most Chardin paintings, there'll be one, two, or maybe three perches for the eye to rest on, where things are in high focus. And the rest will be blurry, and that blur is something very special to Chardin. No one produced this blur before Chardin. He had techniques they didn't want people to see, because there's no record of his what it was like to watch Chardin paint. Um, but it's very, very clear that he has a lot of unorthodox techniques for applying the paint to the canvas. It's very clear that he was handling paint, which you shouldn't do. And if you look at the late self-portraits of Chardin, his skin is going grey, until finally it's completely grey and he's dying of lead poisoning. <laughs> he has been handling paint all his life and it takes its toll. Paint is a very toxic substance. Within the French Royal Academy, Chardin would influence the perception of what still life could achieve. In 1770, another still life painter would submit works whilst applying to join the institution. This artist would face a different kind of prejudice. She was 26 year old Anne Valet Costa. She was one of only four women ever accepted in the French Academy. At the time, very few female painters could even dream of a serious career in art. She was enormously talented, incredibly confident handling both of composition and of the surface texture of things. She was patronised by Marie Antoinette. She uh, enabled Valier Costa to get lodgings in the Louvre, which was absolutely exceptional for a woman. And it meant that she had her, her lodgings and her studio in among the other top artists of her time. The academies were the key institutions if you wanted a successful career as an artist, but they were, of course, deeply problematic for women. At a very straightforward level, women were not allowed in art academies because there were naked men there. And women were not allowed to hire male models to paint from. However, women were allowed to look at bunches of grapes. That's one of the reasons why women flourish in the field of still life painting. It's one of the few areas they're allowed in. Women were barred from acquiring the skills they need for the higher genres, and then they were told that women were only capable of the lowest ones. But although they might be seen as equal to men within that sphere, they could never quite get the sort of higher status and reputation that was open to men. Valaya Costa is typical of a line of female artists throughout history whose desire to paint found expression through the only genre considered suitable for them. Women were marginalised in art and found an outlet in the disregarded genre of still life. The talent Valaya Costa displayed demonstrates that she was the equal of any other academy painter. In the end, her association with Marie Antoinette and the royal court would have a ruinous effect on her career as French society was engulfed in the pandemonium of revolution. By the 19th century, France had been transformed Despite the political turmoil, the strict French academy system had survived. But art too was about to undergo its own revolution. An unknown painter from a small town in the south of France was about to change everything. And still life would lead the charge. The artist's name was Paul Cézanne. Cézanne was born here in the small town of Aix-en-Provence in 1839. It was here he built his studio and dedicated himself to a revolutionary artistic style. Today he's remembered as a monumental figure, the father of modern art. But in his own lifetime, many did not 
or could not understand him or his work. To his contemporaries, his radical painting style looked rushed, imprecise, and distorted. It was the antithesis of the realism that had dominated European art for centuries. Cezanne thinks, oh, light, light falling on objects. Maybe painting is all about perception. How am I going to emphasize that painting is all about perception? I know, I'll paint something really, really banal. I'll paint an apple. And then he says, I'll stun Paris with an apple. He's not really painting an apple. What he's painting is his own way of seeing. And if you look at the apple, he's given us a double outline. And it's his way of saying everything we look at is constantly just, if you look at Cezanne, it makes you feel a bit sick. Picasso said, the great thing about Cézanne, what we value in Cézanne is his anxiety. And painting an apple was his way of showing his anxiety, his uncertainty, his sense that what we see is not fixed. to Cezanne's studio. The studio was designed by Cezanne himself. He wanted a very large picture window on the north and two other large windows on the south. The light is very important in uh, this studio. He wanted to get the same condition he had when he was outside. Cezanne died in 1906 and um, the studio uh, doesn't change anyway. Uh, you have the same atmosphere uh, in this wall. Uh, you always smell uh, the painting and uh, the food. So all the objects in the studio were painted by Cézanne and we can now recognize the main object, like this little plaster, Chupido, who was painted uh, by Cézanne in uh, 10 uh, works. The star is this green pot, an olive pot, a ginger pot, a round bottle, a wine bottle, a glass. All these objects Cézanne painted in his still life are very simple objects. And uh, the form uh, and the reflection of these objects was uh, the main interest uh, for Cézanne for painting them. This is the foot ball uh, we see in so many still lives. You can recognize on this table the specific line here. Of course, the skulls we can recognize in his vanities. On this bottle, we can see his finger marks all around. So it's very emotional to see that uh, this bottle was in the hand of Suzanne. What is amazing is uh, knowing that the simple objects became model of still life. And with this object, he concretized all his theory on paintings. There are no long strokes, there are no improvised strokes in Cézanne. They're very much the record of individual moments of sensation. He wanted to give a kind of exact transcription, not of the scene, but of his perceiving of the scene. So it's a very, very introverted, sensation and consciousness-based kind of art. His project is to tell no lies 
about painting, invent nothing, simply record, and he pursues this project faithfully and without swerving for years and years without an audience. It's, it's a very, very strange story. And he only gets an audience right at the end of his life when he, he doesn't need it, it's too little too late. Cézanne was um, the first painter of the 20th century. He was not the last painter of the 19th century. And uh, the young painters like uh, Picasso, Matisse, uh, and um, a friend of him, Gauguin, uh, thought uh, he was uh, the great painter of all the Impressionists. Picasso called him the father of the modern art, or the father of all the painters of the 20th century. Cézanne had abandoned the fiction that a painting is a reality in which we see a 3D object in a 3D space. The rules of perspective and representation could now be bent to the will of the artist. Still life had become an artistic laboratory for the reworking of the visible world. This impressionistic approach, this challenge to the established orthodoxy, became widespread in 19th century France. Artists such as Renoir, Monet, and Gauguin would establish a new language for still life. And if the genre could be used as a foundation stone for a new type of expression, it would also become fundamental in the development of an entire new art form. Photographers um, started to, to make photographs of still life compositions, mainly because they didn't move the early kinds of photographic processes, you know, you had eight minute exposures. Quite quickly, photographers began to use, in effect, the language of art, the still life language of art, uh, to develop their te technique. And, you know, by, by the 1850s, you get quite amazing uh, still life photography, really quite amazing. Artists definitely used photography and responded to it. So photography changed the way people saw. Once photography itself exists, I think it makes suddenly startlingly clear to painters both the power of that image and its limitations. And it's as if artists suddenly completely reel away in horror from the photographic. So if you look at a Van Gogh painting of irises, it's, it's a million miles away from what a photographer would have done. He's emphasising his own expressive interaction with the flowers, as he does in the sunflowers. He shows them reaching up, he shows them falling down, he shows the rapidity of their ascent and their descent. They become images of himself, but he's also fascinated by their texture, which of course you can't capture in a photograph. He stipples the paint to create that sense of the seed head. And you stroke the painting, if you could, it's not advisable. <laughs> if you could, you can see that, that it would feel rough to the touch, like an actual dried sunflower seed head. So he's given this almost sculptural element, to, I'd say, in reaction to photography. I think photography makes artists scratch their head and think, well, what can painting do that photography can't do? And from there, suddenly, still life becomes the fundamental form of Cubism, which is the single most significant art movement of the whole 20th century. And it's all still life. Cubism allowed the exploration of an object from every possible angle, with artists painting the subject from several different viewpoints at once. Artists such as Picasso and Braque would use still life to provide an anchor point for the fragmented planes and spatial chaos that became the signature style of the new movement. When Picasso is tapping still life, it becomes illegible. He plays around massively within there. It's still acceptable to audiences because we can still read this as, oh, it's a still life painting. And as it were, digest what's happening experimentally far more easily because it's talking a classical language to us. And why is it all still life? Because perception itself, how the artist sees, has become the subject. So if you paint what everybody sees, i.e. still lives, what's on the table, what you're really showing is how you see, how you perceive this notion that 
we travel around an object, that experience exists in time, that the flat image is not doing justice to the complexity of our perception. Painting becomes a form of philosophy, and at the moment that painting becomes a form of philosophy, still life becomes the king sitting on the throne of art. If art is about the elevation of subject, then still life might just be the king. It's been there, acting as an artistic barometer, helping us explore and explain our relationship with the material that surrounds us. The very stuff of life. And in the West, during the 20th century, there was nothing we liked more than stuff. The big difference that makes the 20th century um, different from the previous centuries is the status of objects themselves because at a certain point in the 20th century it became clear that everything's going to be machine made from now on. We come from a world in which everything that we sit on, everything we wear, everything we drive, all of our appliances and technology is machine made. We live in a machine world, a machine age. And at a certain point it's clear that to go on making classical still life in the machine age is, it doesn't make that much sense. Still life shatters into becoming an ordinary feature of newspaper and advertising. It goes to live in advertising. It's not recognized as still life anymore. In the 20th century, if cubists used still life to explore new dimensions, it was advertising that fed on its traditional form. Now today, in the 21st century, still life continues to evolve in surprising ways. What I like and interested in this particular piece of work is that the moment of destruction is the moment of creation itself. Throughout my work, I'm exploring the relationship between painting and photography and, and film. The painting of uh, Juan Cotan that um, I um, refer to in my film Pomegranate um, was at the back of my mind for many years. There is something quite, I would say, chilling about this, um, uh, about this painting. The more I look at it, um, the more it keeps on giving and giving. thinking about the pomegranate and I was thinking about the bullet and there is a moment of eruption, there is a moment of um, interruption. I was imagining the seeds bleeding. They are still alive, but they are as far as one can be removed from a still life because what they actually depict is an event that happened in the most extraordinary speed, a speed that the human being cannot comprehend or conceal. of something you've seen before and are subverted in some kind of way. So these are uh, flowers that I've taken uh, and made moulds of and then cast. And then I built on these little pustules and sores which are based on uh, syphilis and gonorrhea. And for me, flowers are pretty primitive uh, breeding machines. They're basically there to procreate. That's all they are, they're sexual creatures. So I wanted to make them to look like sexual breeding machines. If nature is a barometer of the times we're living in, the, the environment, then these things could be taken as an indication of the pathology of the society that we live in, that things are sick and poisoned and that there's a problem there. So over here we've got some uh, still life pictures that I made 
and they are recreations of meals that prisoners ate on death row before they were executed. So basically I decided that what I was going to do was photograph them in the style of 17th century Dutch still life painting. Which means that you're looking at a photograph of the chicken McNugget through the framework of a Vanitas painting. Which means you're looking at it different from what you'd normally do. You're 